The Things We All Carry is a podcast about first responders and their stories surrounding trauma on the job. The intention of this podcast is to raise awareness and share meaningful conversation around a subject often viewed as taboo or simply ignored. Be aware this content may be graphic and it is real. It may not be suitable for children or adults triggered by this subject matter. Welcome back to The Things We All Carry. It's Monday. And I'm releasing a show that's uh, what's on a day that I don't normally release a show, but I kind of felt that this one was time sensitive and I wanted to get it out there as soon as possible. So I'm going to drop this show on a Monday and uh, just see what happens to it, see where it goes. Hopefully you guys listen to this and, and first of all, listen to Tara's story. Listen to, I don't know, it's so fresh because what's happened in her life has only been uh, about five weeks old now. So listen to that part, but then listen to the part about... Uh, some of the troubles she's going through and, and, and why she's going through some of the issues, uh, both financially and, and just worried about certain pieces of ownership and, and uh, probate and all that. It's a confusing world out there when somebody dies and, and uh, you're trying to figure out their, their affairs. Uh, even more confusing when someone commits suicide and you have to then figure out their affairs and figure out, oh, I don't know, where, uh, where things kind of shake out. And right now, Tara is in a, in a kind of a rough spot because she's, she's worried about losing a mortgage on the house that her name wasn't, wasn't on or the deed. And then um, some of the insurance is either not in her name or may not pay up because of, uh, well, because her, her husband committed suicide. And as we know, some, some policies have the, you know, I guess an addendum that says you can't commit suicide and still cash out your policy, or at least there's a time period where you can't do it and you cash out your policy, and, and that's where she finds herself today. There's a GoFundMe for Tara. Uh, as of, I think as, as of yesterday when I checked, it had about $12,000 in it, and, and she, needs, she needs more than that, and uh, I'd like to get that word out. Uh, the, uh, the link for the GoFundMe is in my Instagram bio and it's in the comments of a couple of the posts so you can find it there and and if you're looking for it and you need it just reach out send me a message i will i will make sure i get that link to you this is not an easy one to listen to tara tells her story she tells well she tells the basis of her story then she tries to tell doug's story um and she she talks about that fateful day where she had to she discovered doug after he he committed suicide and so it's a bit graphic and it's a bit jarring and alarming, but you know what? That's what this show is about is kind of exposing these things and bringing it to the forefront and talking about it and hopefully preventing somebody else from doing this. And it, every time you, every time you hear one of these stories, you, you kind of, you know, shake your head, but it's kind of disbelief, you know, why can't we get that message out there? Why can't we work on things? Why can't we? Why can't just asking for help be more accepted? Why does there have to be a fucking stigma attached to it? Doug left behind Tara, his wife, and two kids. But he also left behind a, a, a mess, to be quite honest with you. You know, the, the emotional toll is one thing, but then you have this, I don't know, this, um, this threat of, economic instability that that kind of ripples out from the from one act it's a devastating act and it's and it's a devastating act initially and then those ripples that come out from it can be just as devastating it seems and i don't know how to get through to people to say hey you know put this stuff out there talk write it down kind of play it out because when you talk about it and you expose it Sometimes it doesn't seem as bad as it was or as bad as you assumed it was. I know I've done it quite a bit. I've been dark. I've been down. And uh, I've turned to a few people and, and, and they listen. And then when you're finished, and then when you're finished, you realize, okay, it's not insurmountable. And you kind of, you, you make your plan and you rock on. You know, if you're in this spot and you're feeling low and you're feeling, I don't know, you feel a sense of, of, 
kind of danger from yourself. You think that you're going to have any sort of self-harm or those thoughts or you have ideations. I, I implore you, there are a few things I need you to do. I need you to talk. I need you to find someone. I need you to send me a message and say, hey, man, I'm struggling. What can I do? I need you to stop drinking. I mean, just stop fucking drinking. When you're already low, the alcohol is not going to make it better. It never makes it better. Then I need you to kind of recalibrate in a way. And I know that sounds so fucking simple. Oh, yeah, just, just recalibrate. That's easy. No, it's not easy. It's not easy at all. But that's why we talk. And that's why we do this with a clear mind, not one filled with alcohol or filled with Xanax or, or whatever it is you're, you're taking to, to kind of get over it. It kind of recalibrate. Take a step back. Process what's really going on. Process what is immediate and what you can do to make a change now. And then, as I've recently told a couple of people, start stacking some victories, even if they're small. I don't care if making your bed is a goddamn victory. Make your bed. Make your bed. Brush your teeth. Take a shower. Take a step out into the sunshine and realize that this world is large and life is... Uh, Life is going to throw curveballs at you, but it's, it's, uh, it's keeping your head down, watching that ball, and only swinging when you're going to get a hit or you're comfortable swinging at a pitch that is in your zone. Know when to let it go. Know when to take a walk, in other words, you know? So start stacking some victories. However that is, however small it is, the small things start to lead to the big things, and the big things start to really start you know, once you start rolling, man, life starts to come at you and you realize that it was never as bad as it seemed. It's that clear mind, a clear path and conversation. It's a necessary thing for all of us, but especially if you're feeling like you don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to do more shows about suicide. I want to do more shows about the victories you know, where we went from when we got down and how we rebounded, not, not the suicides. And it happens all too often, all too often. So that's, I guess that's my message to you today. Talk to somebody, put down the alcohol, put down whatever drugs you, whatever the, the medication is that you might not even be prescribed. You know, I'm not saying cut medication out that, that is in your body and will do you harm if you quit using it. But th whatever you're abusing, let's, let's kind of get as clear-headed as possible and then figure a path forward. That small step leads into a, a bigger step, leads into a leap, lead, leads into a bound. And before you know it, you're running that marathon again. And I will say it one more time. I'm here. I respond to messages. I will call you. I will text you. I'll get on a video conference with you. We can spend some time together. It's too important. It's much too important. Whether you know it or not, you're too important to this world, to the people around you, to your family, to your loved ones, to your coworkers. They might not say it enough, but, but you are. You, you, are that, you are that piece to them. Don't make a decision to remove it like they, they, they'd be better off without you because they wouldn't. Trust me. Ask Tara. She is not better off without Doug. Ask her sons. They are not better off without Doug. Welcome to episode 111 of The Things We All Carry. Today I have Tara Lorenz on the show. Tara lives in North Dakota. And I got a message from Diane Cotter one day. And it was an email calling for help. And it broke down Tara's story. Um, Tara, unfortunately, found her husband, Doug, after he shot himself, and she's struggling to make ends meet in a way that is kind of, I don't know if original, but it's, it's different. It's not just cash. It's the fact that she has no ownership of a house that she thought she did. Her name's not on the mortgage. It's not on the deed. It's the same thing for her car, and insurance papers are a mess. And so this show is kind of a call to help, a call to arms of sorts. We need some cash. We need the GoFundMe to be funded, and we need some legal advice. So if anybody has experience with 
dealing with suicide and the ramifications of suicide from an insurance standpoint, a mortgage standpoint, the deed, any of it, please reach out to me. Please reach out to Tara. Please reach out to Diane Cotter. Reach out to somebody, make it known, and let's see if we can help uh, Tara and her, and her boys out. Thank you for listening. Listen to this call to arms. Step up and help a family out. A quick reminder to please help us build a community which not only recognizes but supports each other through the struggles and recovery. Reach out through Instagram at the things we all carry or email my story at the things we all carry.com to offer support and share your story. Please remember to leave a review on iTunes and give a shout out to any first responder you know, love, or care about. Y'all enjoy the show. <laughs> Okay. So, are you comfortable? Yep, I'm right. comfortable. All right, so now the real talk starts. Good morning and welcome back to the things we all carry. Uh, this morning I have Tara Lorenz on with me. And um, this one I, I really do appreciate. I was, I was contacted by Diane Cotter. And, and you, you guys know Diane from, from her show on, on, on uh, the things we all carry. And her, her advocacy for all firefighters in, in the country. And when, when Diane reaches out and says, Hey, can you do me a favor? Um, can you see how you can help? And, and she reaches out to a few of us. I jump at it because Diane is, is an important figure in, in my life and the life of all firefighters. And so she sent an email about Tara and her family, and it was a call for help because they're going through, they're just going through it right now. And I'm going to let her get into that as, as we get through the story. A quick introduction is she's in the Northwest area of North Dakota. And we just had a discussion about where that is. And, and she says, there's just nothing around. And uh, but I have to imagine there's some beautiful country out there at the very least. And uh, a brief background to her. She is uh, the widow of Doug Lorenz and mother of two sons. Both One is 16 and one is nine. And uh, I welcome her to the show. How are you today? No, oh, thank you. I'm, I'm doing okay. Yeah, we'll get to the doing okay part because uh, it's fresh for you. And I understand that. And, and again, I offered them at the beginning of our conversation. I'm offered here my condolences to you and your family. And it's a, it's a hell of a time to be going through. Thank you. Um, where did you grow up? That's always such a tough one. Um, so my dad was a professor. So I've actually moved 41 times in 45 years. Holy so. shit. Yeah. Um, born in Santa Barbara. Then when he took a job at Harvard, we moved to outside of Boston and then upstate New York when we taught Cornell. And then I moved back to California, but like up in Paradise, California. Died. And no then, idea where Paradise, California is. It, they had a huge fire there a couple of years ago. No, I, uh, I do remember that now. Yes. Yeah. The campfire it killed, unfortunately, like over 80 people, I right. think. Um and so we lived there for a while after my parents split up. And then I went to school nearby in Chico and then kind of went exploring and Florida and Denver and did a year of college in Spain and L.A. And now I'm in North Dakota. So you, you did, a, did a period of exploring. Is it kind of just a free spirit kind of thing or, or what? Yeah, I wanted to just kind of experience different parts of the country and just use that time before I settled down or had kids and things just to see different parts of the country and find my own path. And here's a, here's a weird question. Then what, what'd you find? <laughs> that I'm good at packing a U-Haul. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I've, I've, and, and, and a year in Spain or was it more than a year and, or just a, just a year in Spain? It was my junior year of college was in Spain because one of my majors, I was a psychology and Spanish major in okay. college. And so I did my junior year in Spain and it was absolutely amazing and made some really good friends that I, my two closest friends from there, we still stay in contact. Um, they've been a huge support for me over the last month also. And even some of my international roommates from there have messaged me over the last month and it's been it's just really awesome to have that contact, even though I don't get to see a lot of my childhood friends mm -hmm. in person. Like my best friend from growing up in New York, we haven't seen each other in decades, but we're still really close. And so I guess I got used to maintaining friendships even while miles and miles apart. 
Yeah, and and thankfully it's it's easier to do these days. Obviously, with with things like what we're doing right now. I mean, you can get on the computer and you can see face to face and 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 spend an evening with a friend, basically. Yeah, it is. It's really special. So before we go much further, let me ask you about music. What's the last song you listened to? Again, this might be a little bit embarrassing, but when I drove here to my office, which is like three minutes from my house, um, it popped up with Get Together by Madonna because Madonna okay. is like my all-time favorite. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll give you that. Um, and you mentioned office. What is it that you do for a living? So I am a licensed clinical social worker and I own the only private mental health agency in the entire county here oh. in Mackenzie County, North Dakota. And so I have one employee right now um, and we stay quite busy. So, yeah, I, I would imagine you would. I mean, if you're the only clinic in the area for, for how many miles around you are, are you the only clinic? It's I guess it's the largest county in North Dakota by landmass. So the next closest place would be an hour away to the north of us. And then there are therapists also an hour and a half away from us to the south. But for kind of the hour radius, we're, we're it. I mean, there's some state services, but they're pretty limited in what they can provide. So I have to assume that you, you, your practice is pretty generalized and, and, and you don't specify or, or, or specialize in anything particular yeah we we see the gamut i mean my employee will see three years and up i'll see five years and up and i'm bilingual so i'll do it in english and spanish um and we we see everyone for every kind of background i love to work with moms and kind of the pre and postnatal period but also as law enforcement first responders uh, things like that i still have my california license for social work also so i have a couple clients there i love still helping the especially wildland firefighter community. I, you know, that's an, in, in, excuse me, interesting twist because I've never thought about, um, I guess for some reason I take it, I take it for granted where I am. We're, we're a densely populated area and you, you can't really take a step without finding some kind of service somewhere. Um, and to, to be a first responder in those more rural areas and then you want to find services that, that just adds the challenge because as you well know, sometimes you just don't click with a with a therapist or a provider, and so then if you're only one provider in a, in an hour <laughs> radius, what the hell do you do if you don't click? You know, <laughs> That's so, so do, true. What do you do? Do you send people out for an hour, or do you suggest uh, this format where it's more online based? Or what are you what are you doing if you if you feel like you can't serve a person? Well, I guess I would. I would refer them to, if they don't click with myself or my employee, then I would refer them to the places to the north or to the south of us um, and have some good relationships with those providers too. But I, I try to encourage people to see me at least three times, see if there is a click. And if it just isn't going to work, because the most important thing in therapy is that there's a therapeutic like trust relationship between client and provider. And if it's not the right match, that's okay. It's not going to hurt my feelings. I think that's the, the most important part that people don't realize is it doesn't hurt your feelings. It doesn't hurt a therapist's feelings. They know what that is. It, it's, it, it is, and you know, to use this stupid phrase that I get so tired of, at the end of the day, it is a business transaction with a connection. Yeah, that's hopefully. Girl. So, yeah. Anyway, we got a little sidetracked. I apologize. Thank you for letting me to wander <laughs> down a path there. Um, well, let's uh, let's talk about Doug a little bit. Who was Doug? Oh, and Doug where did was. You, and where did you meet, actually, as well? Well, well, that's a fun story. We actually met in jury duty. Okay. Um, so we met in jury duty in Ukiah, California. It was a really intense trial um, for a guy that had gone on a high speed chase and then dissuaded witnesses and. Um, he shot at the sheriff deputy's car when he was on the high speed chase. He took a hostage at a hotel that was across from my son's preschool. So I remember having to go pick up my son from preschool when the hotel was on lockdown and the whole surrounding area. Then we ended up convicting him on all accounts and he got a record sentence. And the judge in the case was the one who actually married Doug and I. So we sat next to each other for two and a half weeks on a trial and we pretended that we're being all like 
incognito about flirting, but I guess the bailiffs uh, had to have a meeting about what happens if people are flirting during a trial. <laughs> I had to poke them a couple times to stay awake. Um, I loved it because I love law and order and all those kinds of things. I thought it was like the best thing since sliced bread to be on jury duty for such an intense, interesting trial. I was going to say, um, if you have to do jury duty, that's the way to do it right there. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And he was trying to get out of it saying, you know, I've been discriminated against by law enforcement for all my tattoos and I'm, you know, I might have a busy season, but it was December. So he wasn't doing wildland fire right then. So they kept him on. And I remember just thinking, oh, please stay, please stay, please stay. <laughs> I saw him across the courtroom and I'm like, oh my gosh, this man is gorgeous. I thought he was only 21. I thought he was, you know, like 15 years younger than me, but it turned out he was only five years younger. And so is, is a match made in court. <laughs> exactly. Where, where did Doug grow up? She, he was born here in Southern California, um, but then moved up to kind of the Lake County area and grew up there. Um, he came from a family of six, so he has some really awesome siblings. Um, from a couple different marriages from his mom. He had, you know, his siblings are just amazing. His brother has really cool musical talent and Doug really helped him with, Doug played the drums and played soccer growing up. And I don't know, he had a, some rough patches for sure. Didn't really have great father experiences until his mom's current husband, who is like an actual total inspirational person, Vietnam vet. And really took Doug under his wing. And then Doug gained a brother who introduced him to wildland firefighting. So so his, his stepbrother gets him into the business, so to speak. Yes. Yeah. And I don't even call him a stepbrother because it's like the, they're two peas in a pod. They, they really were. And his brother is hopefully going to be able to come up and visit this weekend with his kids. And he's just, he's a really, really sweet person. So when does he start with the wildland firefighting? It was, I guess, 2010, and he had, before that, he had, like, managed a smoke shop in San Francisco and was a DJ and gotten into kind of the partying and drug scene. He has this really cool group of friends from Santa Rosa, California area, and they were able to come out uh, two weeks ago and visit and just the best core group of friends. But he, he did have some side tricks that he would get into, and he definitely... Tried to live life to the fullest in his 20s. I think that, you know, barring doing any damage to people, living your life is not a bad thing to do. Yeah. And and I think he had a lot of fun and he, he had a lot of concussions. <laughs> I've known a few people with a lot of concussions and, and it makes life interesting. That's for certain. Yeah. He was, he's kind of a wild... He was always kind of a wild guy, and our nine-year-old is fearless, just like him. When I was pregnant with um, my youngest, I remember having dreams, thinking that he was going to come out with full sleeve tattoos, riding a Harley, just like his dad. <laughs> and it's not that far off. Completely badass if it happened. Well, a miracle, I guess. <laughs> so you guys yeah. meet in California. He's he picks up wildland firefighting before you guys met, correct? Yes. And you guys meet on jury duty, and Somehow you end up in, in North Dakota. Tell me about that. Yeah, so she was a hot shot, actually, when I met him. Um, and so he'd been laid off for the winter when we did jury duty, but he started in May and went to apprenticeship school and finished, finished his apprenticeship, but then did Caesar two of hot shotting while we were together. And then he got switched to an engine briefly. And then he just realized that, like, California was so competitive for wildland firefighting and he really wanted to be able to move up in his career. And so he put in applications for I think like five different states and we agreed whoever picks him up first will go. Hmm. And his uh, his brother that he's really close with lives kind of near Bismarck. And then his parents decided to move out here in the fall of 2016. And then we got the call that North Dakota wanted to pick him up um in february 2017 and so we started doing the process and he left a couple months before i did i let the kids finish or my oldest finish out the school year and then packed up everything and moved across country 
and came to North Dakota where I'd never been. And honestly, I wanted to visit all 50 states except for North Dakota because why bother? <laughs> and now I live here. So it was karma that you'd end up living there. <laughs> exactly. And and it was it was tough at first because I was working for someone that I will just be honest was kind of a snake in the mm -hmm. beginning and then decided in 2019 that I wanted to start my own business and break off and that helped me feel more comfortable here and more supported. So he, he was, he was wildland in North Dakota as well. Was he ever a structural firefighter? So he was wildland here only, and he just became captain of the engine. There are only two forest service engines in North Dakota and they're an hour and a half apart. So they managed like over a million acres of wow. wildland and they, they got sent all over the place too. Um, but just in the fall, I think in November, he joined the local volunteer department. They've been trying to get him for years because mm -hmm. he's good friends with the uh, chief and assistant chief and a bunch of the other guys. And so they finally convinced him to join in the fall. And so he was just recently trying to do his firefighter one with them, uh, which he had to explain to me is a totally different process from firefighter one in wildland. Yeah, it's, so. it's completely different. Yeah, it, it, it seemed really similar to when he was a probate for Motorcycle Club back in California. Okay. Like, you keep pitching in and do all the work, and you're going to go on all the calls. Right. And then the, the, the differences between the two styles of firefighting, you know, those of us in structural firefighting don't want to do wildland. Those, of, those, those guys in wildland don't want to do structural necessarily. So it's, it's, it is, it's, it's a different world for me to talk about wildland. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a completely unknown world to me. Yeah, he, he did not want to do structure for a long time, but he really loved the people at the department. And so he figured he'd give it a shot. And I think he, he wanted people to be proud of him probably more than anything. And he wanted, he wanted validation and he wanted just to know that he was doing something that his kids could be proud of. Yeah, that makes sense. That that definitely makes sense. Did, I guess, you know, this, this is weird conversation because you and I have, have never spoken before. We emailed back and forth the other day. Um, and so it, you'll have to pardon me if I step on toes. I don't want to step on toes, but I kind of, I, I know the ending to this story. And I think the audience is probably picking up on what the ending to the story is. But were there hints what was going on with Doug? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for our entire relationship, because um, we were together for 10 years and married for eight. I think that I always saw that there were demons that he was fighting. And, you know, when we met, he would drink lightly, just kind of socially, no big deal. He joined a motorcycle club. It got heavier and heavier and heavier. But that was also when he found, for him, he found a really tight-knit knit group of friends and a brotherhood in the motorcycle club. And he had a Harley. Um, it's a cool purple Harley that he loved. And he had a lot of close relationships with the MC guys. But that also, I, I have to admit, it put a wedge between the two of us because that he joined the motorcycle club two weeks after we had our son. It takes and a so, lot. Of, both of those take a lot of time. Yeah. And, and then fire season was really big those years, the first couple of years of our youngest life. And so it's like if he wasn't off on a fire, he was at the MC or doing other things. And I really wanted him to have that support, but there was, there were hints of the demons and, and more and more alcohol use and just some depression. I, I had encouraged him for years to go to counseling and he was like, no, I really respect your profession, but I, I don't think it's for me. He had had a really bad experience when he was a teenager, which I understand. Cause a lot of people get, you know, you're going to go to therapy yeah. when you're a teenager and most teenagers I work with were like, this is dumb. <laughs> of course. Yeah. 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 And not only dumb, kind of but, weirdo. It, but it's a lot of work. It, it is. It is. And I have some awesome teenage clients too. And I try to be, I'm a total goofball with most of them and I don't hide my goofiness. But I think Doug was afraid of it. And, and I think he had had some self-esteem issues that came from his 
relationships with male figures growing up early on and some other stressors, some childhood trauma stuff, some of it that I don't think he ever told me about. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, he had shame and secrets. Okay. And both of those grew over time and the alcohol grew over time. And by the time we moved to North Dakota, the drinking, it, it kind of progressively got worse and kind of morphed from beer to beer enchiladas and then beer and fireball and then fireball and bourbon and then a bottle of bourbon a night plus some fireball. And it just, it kept escalating. And I'm not, I'm not here to slam him. Because I no. adored him, but he was fighting a lot of things inside. And there were things that I wanted to touch and I just couldn't, no matter how hard I tried to convince him that he was loved and appreciated and adored and supported from all of us. I think that's such a, an important piece right there. You might recognize it. He might recognize it. But unless someone's willing and able to, like you say, touch it. It, it, it's not going to, it's not going to just knowing it isn't going to resolve anything. Yeah. Unfortunately, I, we had different love languages too. And I think that the ways that I tried to show him love just didn't hit for him. And I remember trying to ask about those things many times and we did do couples counseling in the last year and a half, a couple of times. And he did start therapy in the last year and a half. He, he went, maybe a handful of times. And he, he told people, he told a lot of his friends that in the last six months or so that he had given up alcohol. And unfortunately, like I'm, it hurts to say some of these things, but I'm, I'm in the mode of no shame and no secrets now. Yeah. He, he didn't give up alcohol. He hid it differently. Uh, yeah. There are a number of us in this field that are able to, to hide it differently for, for a period of time. Yeah. And cleaning out his apartment um, that he had, there were liquor bottles everywhere. Yeah, and and like you say, he hid it, so you're you're not seeing it on a day to day basis. It, and you're the closest person to him. I was, and then so he had in August of 2022, he had asked for a separation. Okay. Well, immediately after he came home from a fire. And I knew something was just wrong. And about a month later, I found out about his first affair. Um, and I'm kind of pretending that as if my kids are listening to this and, and my, my 16 year old already now, I mean, he unfortunately already kind of knew some of these things mm -hmm. were going on. So I'm not sharing something that I wouldn't share with my kids. Um, so I found out about the first affair who was a fellow firefighter. and strange turn of events she and i are now facebook friends so i hated her for the last year and a half but now she and i are trying to at least be okay with each other and she's been really supportive um but he had that affair while he was on a fire and then came home and asked me for a separation and then we told the kids and he got an apartment and he kept that for the last year and a half and that was September. And then in January, he and I decided to try working on it again. And so we worked on it for a year and he was only occasionally going to his apartment like two days a week just because I needed still some space to kind of process. Are we, are we doing okay or are we not? And I'm the kind of person that I need alone time to be able to figure out how yeah. I feel sometimes. And it was a, it was a really painful process. So there were five women during that period. Um, During the period of either. when you're when you're actively trying to work on it, yes. Okay. Well, and I was actively trying to work on it, and he was back and forth. But since the time that he said let's work on it, as far as I know, there wasn't anyone. Um, but my son said he saw him on Tinder somehow. He did some kind of internet search and saw that his dad was on Tinder even a couple months ago. But in January of this year, three weeks before he passed away, um, I had seen on my Verizon account that he was messaging someone 
all night long. And unfortunately, he didn't want to tell me the truth. And so he told me that it was a crisis line worker. And I thought that's, you know, I'm not going to knock you for that. I understand. He was off on a, it was not a fire, but a class in Montana. And, but then I started thinking about like, why would a crisis line worker give out their personal cell phone number? Right. Because that doesn't, in my field, that's not what we do. Not typically. Not and so I reached. In the field. Right. And so I reached out to her and she said, no, um, he had used his family nickname and was on Tinder while he was in Montana and was trying to hook up with her. And so I told him, like, I, I love you tremendously and I wanted this to work, but I had set the boundary if I find out about one more thing. So six girls was my limit. Yeah, I could and, understand why. Yeah, I mean, while we were... Well, we're more in the active separation stuff. I went off on one date with one person and and never messed around or anything with that person. And regardless of what he might have, I think he probably told people it was more than that. But, and then he found out about that one date and wanted me back. And so there was some control there too. And I mm-hmm. think that that goes along with the alcohol and the fear of, losing something, but also not sure if he really warned it in the first place. And so there's a lot of mixed hard feelings to process, like both of us not sure if we felt wanted or not. Um, but six girls was my limit. So I said, we, we do need to get a divorce. I love you tremendously. And we, we were going to be awesome co-parents. We had already kind of done the week on week off at his apartment and the house with the kids. We had, each of us would see the kids every single day, get along great. Um, I mean, even my 16 year old says like, you guys never treated us any differently. It was always really, it was fine. It was a really healthy transition, even for him. My nine year old kind of struggled with it at first because he likes his world. <laughs> yeah. But we were going to be okay as co-parents and we were going to be okay even if we had to get a divorce. Um, but unfortunately during that three week time, he was doing classes for the forest service and a ton of classes and meetings for the volunteer department, constantly busy, had one of his cousins come up to visit and that was really fun for him, but it was just so much going on and he was throwing up multiple times a day and he was getting more and more into crisis. Well, you said throwing up and what's that from? The anxiety. It's okay. Yeah. Just just the physical manifestation of, of the, of the anxiety. Yeah, he would he would think about us getting divorced or he would think about having to tell the kids that we we're getting divorced and he would just have to go throw up and he was barely eating and he had dropped a tremendous amount of weight and I was trying to be supportive with him but also set boundaries which I I'll just be honest I don't always have the best backbone mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah still being friends and we'd sit in bed and binge watch Law and Order together still and spend time with the kids, spent uh, Super Bowl Sunday together, all that kind of stuff. And then, and then it just escalated and he would, on February 18th, she, I went over to his house and dropped off some z because he needed that to sleep and he had asked me if I could bring it to him. Sorry he hadn't had any alcohol, but I kind of wonder, you know, well, then why would you be able to drive? But he was trying to study for fire class for the local department. And so I brought him some Z-Quill and we struggled on the couch and he was telling me about this show, Banshee, that he really liked watching. Um, and then he walked me into my car and gave him hugs and stuff. And and he looked pretty jaundiced, I have to say. And he he had a very, very, very strong odor of vomit. And I left and he went upstairs to his apartment and he called me not even five minutes later and said he had just thrown up and there was blood. Mm. And I said, I would turn around and take him to the ER. Absolutely. And he's like, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. And then I got home and it's a small town. So it only took me a couple of minutes, got home, started cooking dinner and he was calling me and I was checking in on him and he sent me a picture of it and it was a speck of blood. And I said, well, you have a doctor's appointment on Tuesday. This is Sunday. And, you know, if you're choosing not to go to the ER, at least tell the 
nurse practitioner on Tuesday, what's going on? And, you know, it was a psych nurse. And so he was going to be trying to get on some medications for his anxiety. And he had therapy that day also. And he went back and forth. I'm like, I love you. Thank you so much for being who you are and supporting me. And then five minutes later, how, you know, I don't, I'm not worth anything to you. You don't help me. You, you would help any of your clients or the kids if they needed help and you're not taking me to the ER and it was just kind of back and forth and back and forth. And I believe in that time after I left his apartment, she, cause he really didn't have the smell of alcohol on him when I saw him. I believe that he opened up a bottle of bourbon and I think, I guess people call it a fifth. So it was right. just, it was really big and he drank that entire bottle because it was sitting next to him later. Um, I believe he had a couple Xanax. I'm not sure what else because the talk screen hasn't come out yet. Um, he only took the tiniest, tiniest little bit, bit of Zequil from what I could tell. Um, and I believe he went down to his truck and he always kept a handgun in the center console of the truck And because the next day I found it unlocked. And we had some conversations some phone calls back and forth and at about 6 45 to 6 55 that night we were talking on the phone and he got calm and he said you know I'm just I'm starting to feel really sleepy from the Xanax I promise I haven't had anything to drink I'm just gonna go to sleep I said okay sweetie I'll see you tomorrow you know the next day was to be president's day he was off federal holiday and the kids were off of school and I said just come hang out with the kids and he got really really quiet um, sorry, this part is hard. He got really good. And I said, okay, I love you, sweetie. I'll let you go to sleep. And I kind of paused for a second and then I hung up. And I think from the images that I have in my head, I think he put the phone down, picked up the gun and from his heart rate monitor, also on his watch, he picked up the gun and he strangely used his left hand and he he shot himself in the head. And that was Sunday night, and I thought he had gone to sleep. I remember having this huge wave of emotion go over me, and strangely, it was a peaceful emotion, which mm. kind of makes me feel guilty now, but it was something huge that just washed over me, like, okay, he's settled, he's in a good place. I'll focus on the kids, make, you know, serve them dinner, and at least he's calm, he's happy. And... The next morning, texted him, didn't hear from him, thought, well, maybe he was just sleeping it off or something. But the kids never heard from him. I stopped by on my lunch break, and I didn't have my son's key. I didn't have my own key to his apartment. Didn't have my son's key, but I had the other truck key. Um, it's technically my business owns a truck. Um, it was unlocked. And so I texted him, like, I'm at your door. I'm trying to hear you. Like, what's going on? Are you just... Are you drunk or avoiding me? What's going on? And I thought I heard him in there. So I said, okay, well, I'll just come back after work with Skip, with our oldest key. And so that's why I did. And my afternoon clients, I had to even tell them, like, I'm really distracted because I'm, I really worried about my husband. And I kept asking my 16 year old now, almost 16 year old, you know, have you heard from dad? Have you heard from dad? He's like, no, this is really strange. I haven't. And I could tell he was starting to get worried. Yeah. And so I said, well, I'm going to come home and I'll grab the key from you. And I raced home right after five. And honestly, I was in a panic by that time. And I was trying to hide it from him, but I, I was, I was definitely panicking. And so I drove to his house and I still remember the song I was listening to and singing along, trying to stay calm. And I was thinking, okay, I'm walking in here. I sh had been debating welfare check, but I thought he's, you know, I heard him at lunch. I think he's probably just drunk and avoiding me. I don't know why something's going on. He's been in a rough spot, but I thought, okay, he's either drunk or maybe I might be walking into a bad scene where he OD'd. I mm -hmm. thought Xanax and alcohol. And I turned the key in the door and I took a deep breath. I'm like, okay, I got to get ready for what this is. And I remember passing a cop cruiser on the way over. And I opened the door and you can instantly see him on the couch. And those are images that I know that I will never forget. And we'll hopefully do some more processing on. But 
he had been gone since Sunday night mm. and it was horrendous and the visual and smell and everything else just stick with me. And it's, and I'm, it's one of those things that I was really afraid for a long time afterwards, just kind of, it popped in and it's only been a, a month and a few days at this point, but I've tried to do some really hard work on that to let it, that not pop up as often. And the visitation strangely helped me with that as painful as that was. The, but so he was. The visitation was around the memorial. Is that what you mean? Yeah. The, the viewing, we did the viewing open casket because we were able to, because this is going to sound awful, but there was no exit wound. Right. And so we were, yes. and it was thankfully, I mean, it was noticeable to me, um, but it was not, not noticeable as horrific as other gunshot wounds could be, I'm sure. Right. Which I've never seen another one, but yeah. Ooh, that's a and lot. And so then I had to go. Yeah, it was, it was a lot. And I called 911 and the response was so incredibly fast and had to sit there and I called my best friend in town who also works for a service and her husband works for a service and they drove from like 15, excuse me, 15 minutes away and they came to sit with me while I waited for the detectives. And I asked my friend's husband to go take my kids some food because it was, you know, dinner time and they're sitting there thinking mom's checking on dad. Yeah. And it turns out my husband's mom had written my oldest also like, hey, I haven't heard from your dad all day. And my son said, yeah, my mom's over there checking on him now. And so later on that night, I had to come home and sit down and my friends came over too. And I had to sit down and tell my kids that their dad had passed away. And I'm honest with them. I said, you know, your dad was really in a rough spot for a while and, and he had been battling a lot of demons for a long time and he was really sad and he, he took his own life. And they did, I think the next day ask how, and, and I was honest with them. Um, but I said, it was not like what you see on video games or those things. It was, I didn't want to tell them how awful it was for me, yeah. but it was, you know, not like what they would see on kind of call of duty crap or whatever. Uh, cause I didn't want them to have that fear in their minds also, but I am honest with them that it was suicide. Um, and so that was a lot to process. And then because my oldest had said that Doug's mom had been reaching out to her, I had to call his mom and tell her also, um, instead of the detective telling her, because I thought that I, I only had the emotional strength to tell my kids, but I ended up telling her also. Um, and that was horrific as well. I mean, that was, I don't think it was any secret that Doug was probably her favorite of six kids. And and he was a mama's boy. He was definitely a mama's boy. And so telling her that her child had passed away, I can't even imagine what that was like for her. But between my kids and her, I just, it's, it's too much loss. Yeah. I, I notifying family members of something like that is, is unimaginable to me. Yeah. I've done it, you know, from a detached point of view not being related to the story, but to, to be in your position, it would be, I, I don't, I, I don't know how I would do it. Yeah. I was terrified. And I remember like sitting in the hallway in Doug the Burberry complex with the police, you know, going in and checking on him and then waiting for the detective to show up. And, and I wasn't, I wasn't sobbing. I wasn't screaming. I was just absolutely panicked inside and rocking back and forth wondering how am I going to tell my kids yeah and I really wanted someone else to tell his mom just because I didn't think that I had the strength to do that um and she and I had had kind of a on again off again relationship but it was it was really painful to to tell all of them really and truly yeah so that's that's just that part. Yeah. Know? That's just notifying your kids yeah. and his mom and 
And, and I say just that part because discovering him is, is devastating, but that leads you to a whole nother chain of events, correct? You know, you have to get through the memorial stuff, but then, I mean, you're put in this position where now you're going, you're trying to figure out for lack of a better term affairs, you know, the, the, right. the, 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 the ramifications of, of what he's done, you know, how it affects your life and how it's going to affect your kid's life. Exactly. And just the logistics of everything. And I'm not a logistics kind of a person, but thankfully my, my identical twin sister, uh, she worked as an event planner for like 15 years and she lives in San Francisco area. She flew out. You know, I notified people. I found him on a Monday. She was there by Wednesday, yeah, which was amazing. And so she flew out and she spent a week with me and she helped me go through the horrendous process of meeting with the funeral home and uh, picking flower types and just the nuances of stuff. Like he, he had mentioned over the years certain things about his, his, you know, kind of line of duty death preparation things that they do in the forest service. And I'm sure that they do in structure fire too. Um, he had told me he wanted a pine box. He had told me he wanted to be buried, never cremated because of wildland fire. He avoided Shoot getting burned over and so he didn't want to be cremated um he had me about two years ago create a playlist on my apple music thing for four funeral songs to mm. play for him and so i think that it was also something that he had always known was ahead somehow that he was going to die before me and he had even mentioned to his assistant or uh, engine captain even just a few weeks before he died that if anything ever happened to him that i would be set well, as of even two days ago, what Doug thought would happen, turns out he didn't update a lot of his paperwork. Mm. Probably, I'm choosing to believe, probably not since we met. And so all of his work benefits, I am not the beneficiary. None of it. I am the beneficiary to his bank account and to two small life insurance policies that one of them will pay and will cover half the funeral cost. Hmm. And the other one probably won't pay because it was renewed in 2022 and there's the two year um, period for suicide. Right. And so I will probably have half the funeral cost covered. And then there is this amazing support in GoFundMe. But I have to say like, I am terrified right now because the house was in his name, the deed and the mortgage. My car was in his name. The only thing I realize now, the only thing I own is my business and the, my business owns his truck. Right. I own nothing. He had this really enormous ice castle for ice fishing. He owned that. Like everything really is in his name and it's not about the monthly payments. I can, I can do those. It's, they're all in his name. And so I've had to open probate to try to see, you know, assets and liabilities and whatever those terms are that money stuff is not my thing. Cause I'm a social worker. Like social workers are not known for no number of skills. No, you're not. You're not. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. And so just going through the rigmarole and thankfully my landlord for my business is an estate attorney. And so he's oh. now my probate attorney and he's just down the hallway so I can, you know, go bug him right. all the time. And I meet with him on Monday and then I'll find out more. And the mortgage company can't tell me what my options are until next week either. And so I'm just in this waiting game to find out what are my options. And I just want the stability for my kids to not have to move after this. And as someone who's moved, like I said, 41 times, I'm okay with moving, but I don't want to have to do that right now. And no, there is a study that I still remember from college that, you know, risk factors for accident or illness in the next two years can be impacted by the losses and changes that you have in the last two years. And this is huge. I don't want to put my kids through a move on top of the loss of their dad. No. No, of course you don't. So it's kind of fighting for stability. So the deed and the mortgage are in his name and, and you, you have no, I don't know. I don't know how to term it. Legal claim. Is that, is that what the argument is? Yeah. So I, I, I signed papers when we bought the house and I asked four people that day. So I'm on the deed, right? I'm on the deed, right? And they all said, yep, 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 yep. You're on the deed. 
Well, it turns out I'm not on the deed. So that was one blow. And I think I have the right of survivorship. And with probate, um, I've gotten some conflicting information. So I'm just waiting until next week to hear the actual real truth. But um, I think that they there is a requirement that they pass it along to me, but whether they'll speed up the mortgage and make me pay it all up front or refinance it into my name, it's those things. And to be able to refinance it in my name is huge because, I mean, honestly, I have the income, but I don't have the greatest credit. So we always let ducks be better than mine. And so there's just a lot of unknowns. Will I even get a mortgage in my name? And I can qualify as first-time home buyer. Like all these other things that I have to think of. And I had made a post how Diane Cotter found out about this. So I made a post in one of the firewife groups that's mostly structured, but some wildland wives too. Like, hey, do you guys know of, is there so many real estate agents in that group? They're fabulous. But they often post about firefighter, you know, mortgage programs or those kinds of things, homes for heroes. But I said, are there any that you know of for widows of firefighters? And that's how Diane reached out to me and we ended up talking. And it's just, I'm just trying to figure out everything I can do to fight to keep the house and put it into my name and not not be under like up a creek right. from trying to do it. And I know that before you guys left California, he was an active part of a union, correct? It, yeah, I, I think that, I think that he was unionized there. But not in North Dakota. So there, there there's not a union that can help anything no. in, in North Dakota. No, the liaison from the Forest Service, who was Doug's kind of boss's boss, has been absolutely amazingly helpful and we're having phone conversations every day at noon just to kind of check in and touch base and he and his wife and kid put together pants from the wildland firefighter foundation and ribbons for people to wear at the funeral um i have a lot of support but right now i don't have a lot of answers right like i have tremendous amounts of support and people have recommended different nonprofits to go to and it feels kind of icky like i don't want it to seem like it's a money grab because I you know funerals to me are always where a death is always about honoring the person and doing what they want this right. is not about some kind of get rich quick scheme or anything I'm not looking to go to Tahiti I just want to know that my kids will have the house and I do have a vehicle you and know, that's all that's one thing that I don't know unless you've experienced loss in your life at any point you have no idea how much a funeral costs it's unbelievable i mean thankfully you know we made it as kind of my twin mentioned it as a joke at first she's like you know they sell caskets on costco Mm -hmm. and we ended up getting a pine box because that's what he wanted and we got a really nice pine box from costco delivered i had to drive over to montana to receive it um and it's just even just all the details and picking out flowers and i'm not a I know like tulips and roses. So my twin and my best friend, Sarah, like went and geeked out together on picking flowers for me. I just told them the color scheme and they, they picked out what I wanted, but all the, all the little details, how to write the program, how to do the thank you cards that Mm -hmm. I still have to send out and who to send the thank you cards to, because there was a North Dakota firefighter association post about sending my youngest birthday cards Mm -hmm. because he turned nine, five days after we found Doug. And his first response when I had to tell him about his dad passing away was, I'm just so sad he's not going to be here for my birthday. Of course. And so we had to make, you know, the first weekend after, after hearing about or realizing that Doug was gone was trying to make my little guy's birthday fun. Yeah. And we did a ton and my twin was here and I had friends come over and someone brought ball pit balls. We made a mm-hmm. ball pit downstairs in the living room and took him to the arcade three hours away to the closest mall. Um, Cause we live with no civilization, basically a joke. <laughs> <laughs> but we were really trying to do it up. But by the end of the night, I was near hysterics because I was so overwhelmed by the noise and everything and just missing Doug and yeah. wishing that this wasn't happening. Yeah. And my oldest turns 16 next week, and I know that it's going to be again, but we've gotten mail and packages from firefighters and bikers and 
We even got a card from the lieutenant governor of North Dakota who's from this town. It's like the support is tremendous. I mean, it would take me an hour every day to open the mail. Right. And the financial support is tremendous as well. And that helps alleviate some of the oh shit feeling. Um, since thankfully I can cuss on here. Oh, like yeah. the oh shit feeling. <laughs> oh, how do I do this? How do I make it work? Like I am I was a single mom for five years before I met Doug. Like I can I can figure shit out. I say I'm a redhead for a reason. My red hair is fake. It's like fire engine red, but but I will figure shit out as best I can. I will rob Peter to pay Paul if I have to, but I'm in full go mode as much as I can. I just don't know how to do it all. And then trying to manage work and then, you know, the, the regular stuff of making sure kids yeah. eat and go to bed on time and take their meds and just all the stuff. So what, I guess, what is it that you need the most from, from people? See, that's what I was struggling with, even emailing back and forth with you the other day, because it, I don't know at this point. I think that so much of it will, I'm in the hands of the mortgage company yeah. to say what they're going to do. And if, if they say I have to refinance or speed up the loan, I ain't saying it, but I do need financial help to be able to do that because interest rates are double what they were when we bought the house. I think mm -hmm. we bought it two weeks before COVID hit. Yeah. Um, and I'm scared. And yet I, it's so disgusting to me to say that out loud because, you know, I've always, since my oldest was five, I can support myself, but I, I don't know what's going to happen. And if there are, I guess connections are hugely important to me. Like yeah. knowing if there's a, a nonprofit or something like that or a resource that can help widowed firefighters or widowed first, I don't even, I didn't consider him a first responder so much because wildland fire is so rarely a first responder, but still in that same stream of things. Yeah, of course. Um, it's yeah. It's just seeing if there's a, a path forward that's the biggest thing is so that my kids because my nine-year-old even asked me the other day he's like i don't even know how he figured this out that it's a question because i try to keep this stuff away from him but he's like mom what what happens if you know you sell dad's truck and then what if we lose the other car how we're going to get around it's going to take you a long time to walk to pick me up from school it's like I don't want my nine-year-old worrying about that kind of stuff right. and when it gets to negative 60 in the winter here not having a car is not feasible. Yeah, you know, there's the beautiful part in North Dakota. <laughs> yeah. Gee. We're supposed to get like six to 12 inches on Saturday. Oh, Jesus. Anyway, 60 <laughs> degrees the other day. So yeah, yeah it, it changes on a dime. Yeah. Hey, guys, quick break right here just to check in and thank each of you for listening to the show. Your support has been paramount, and I appreciate all of you. I have one request, though. I need you to share the show with everyone you know. Help me get the word out and spread these stories as far and as wide as we can. While you're at it, please leave a review of the show wherever you happen to listen. Feel free to reach out to me at any time to share your story, to talk, or to pass on suggestions. Let's get on with the rest of the show. You know, I, I, I want to go back, and, and I don't mean to make light of anything, but how surreal is it to drive to Costco to pick up a casket? We didn't have to drive to Costco because Costco is the close. There's only one Costco that I know of in all of North Dakota and it's in Bismarck. So we're three hours away from Bismarck. Um, but I had to drive to the funeral home just over the border in Montana. Okay. Because that's where Doug was being kept. And okay. so I had to receive it and inspect it. And then, of course, it came and it, it wasn't correct. It wasn't lined the way that I was told it was going to be. And so I had to then go. I was going to Walmart the next day in a different town after taking my kids for intakes for therapy for themselves. And so I had to go buy comforters and a friend of mine bought some purple fabric because Doug's favorite color was purple. So we had to line the casket ourselves. And, you know, the small little positives was the shade of purple matched the purple and tan shirt that I picked out for him to be buried in. Right. And 
try to pick out an outfit that he would have liked and all those things like going through his closet and the the local fire department um two days after i found him packed up and cleaned his entire apartment in one day mm-hmm. for me and it's all in a trailer in my driveway and so it's too stuffed for me to go through at this point but i'll get a storage unit so we can go through it but like all the things that we don't think would have to happen and i'm sure you know doug was in one track mind thinking i know that when people are in that abyss that's the only thing they could think of is i'm in so much pain and the the thought that everyone else will be better off without him Mm -hmm. and that's where a lot of the anger comes from and i think for a lot of people that have experienced suicide in some ways it's it's not better without you this is it's never what i wanted it's definitely not what his kids or his parents, his siblings, his best friends. It's not what any of us wanted for him. And then I know that, I know cognitively, people always look for someone to blame. And I know that the wife, especially the wife that just asked for a divorce three weeks prior, is the one to blame. I may have needed to end our marriage or transition it, but this is not what I wanted. And... While at first I blame myself, I don't right now. It was not my fault. It was his choice. It was his tragic choice. And it was made under the influence of sadness and um, and unbelievable shame and secrets. But it was not my fault. Yeah, you add to that Xanax and alcohol. Yeah. It's not, it's not, it, it wasn't a clear mind. That's for damn sure. No, not at all. And it, and I you know a lot of people are, have said, you know, I wish he would have reached out. He was reaching out to a lot of people. He just wasn't telling them yeah. what was going on. And, you know, I I knew that he was in a rough spot. But that day, that moment, right when we hung up, he was calm. He said he was going to sleep. He, he seemed like it was, you know, it was going to be okay. He was looking for to seeing the boys the next morning. And if I had had this inkling that he was going to do that right then, I absolutely would have called 911. But that's something that I had had to tell him before in setting boundaries with him is if I think that you're suicidal again, because I had I tried to have him hospitalized in October of 22. And he didn't have to get hospitalized because he refused a blood test. And the DA here wouldn't make a court order for them to take his blood. So he got to go home mm-hmm. and then he lied to his family and said that he never had been holding a gun to his head. And so they all believed it, you know, cause they want to believe him. And I get that, but I got made out to be this evil monster. Um, just trying to put him, you know, under the gun for something. And that was all a lie, but it, I walked in on him with a gun to his head in October of 22 and over the years, he made multiple gestures. I had to block him from the closet where his guns were kept. I had to chase after him. I had to beg him to go to sleep because sleep was the one thing that would reset him. And years and years of so many times of gestures and at least one attempt before what I consider an attempt. And then asking for help, but also then getting threatened to never ask for help again. And so there were a lot of things that people didn't know because he wasn't telling them. And I, I was under huge, huge pressure not to ever ask anyone for help again. You know, you talk about the the fact that when you hung up that night, he, he was in a, a state of calm. And yeah. that's, that's a theme that runs through the stories of some of my guests who have, who have gotten to the point where they, they were actively pursuing suicide and, and something happened. You know, I, I, one guy talks about buying the equipment to kill himself in the store and the line being too long. And so he gave right. up and just because the line was too long, but it, you know, all of these guys have all talked about the calm that comes over when they finally make the decision. And, and that that's what, that's what came to mind when you said, you know, we hung up and he was calm. Yeah. And it was because I, I don't know. I, I there is this, is there is this odd calm and odd quiet that comes to the mind when when that decision is some is somehow made yeah 
Yeah. It's just hard it's, to think of because part of me yeah, wonders if yeah, he hard. was mad. I wonder if he wanted me to hear it. I wonder if he knew that I had hung up. Mm. But when I think back, his phone was down on the same side of him that he used the gun. So he he must have put the phone down right. and then picked it up. But for the last for three and a half weeks or so, I really believed until I got his phone back just on Monday afternoon, I really believed that he thought I was still on the line and wanted me to hear it. Yeah, that um, from a call aspect of, of a firefighter, I've been on the other side of that. I've, I've, I've responded to that call and that's, that's unbelievably devastating. Yeah. So normally I would say, where are you today? But we know where you are today. You're, you're recovering, you're, you're processing, you're, you're fighting for things that you need in your life. Um, you talked about the two insurance policies. There's the GoFundMe, which, which we, I posted about and, and I'll add it to, to more posts as we get the show out. Um, how are the kids? They've had, it's been a unique thing to kind of watch their process because we had family visitors and, you know, usually, usually at the house, we only have visitors like maybe once or twice a month for like an hour or so here and there. We had family with us almost constantly, which was absolutely wonderful. And I was trying to soak up all the support, but we had people there until last Thursday. So a week ago yesterday, my brother left and he was the last one. Um, and then it was quiet. And so the kids finished up spring break and had to go back to school. And then my oldest anxiety came in because all the homework that he had missed and his mm. grades. And he is, he is brilliant. He's my little scientist kid. And he had ACT testing on Tuesday this week. And he loves, he's weird. He loves standardized testing. <laughs> so, but he probably didn't do as well this time as he has done before. I mean, he got the top ASVAB score in the school when he took it recently and he's only a sophomore. And, mm -hmm. um, on Monday morning, it hit my youngest and he was crying and saying how much he missed his dad. And he was afraid of going to school, afraid that he was going to feel even more sad and not be able to get through the day. But he has this fabulous teacher who's my favorite teacher either of my kids have ever had. And the school district is not renewing her contract. So I'm also in the advocacy mode for that. Jesus. You know, like the good teacher doesn't get her contract removed. Right. But then the one that yelled at my son last year, called him annoying and was a total brat to him all year long. She stays. So it's, you know, fighting the system on a couple different levels, but they both have good support now and my high schooler I reached out to all of his teachers and the school counselor and got a lot of support and saw that he doesn't have to worry about so much of the homework things he still has to do catch up but mm -hmm. he has to write a paper on Macbeth but I love Shakespeare so I'll help him and I offered to do his Spanish homework for him and not tell his Spanish teacher and <laughs> <laughs> he he can't he has to do the Spanish tests in school I'm like dang it I would totally do yeah, it for you I don't care I would have nailed it <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, they're, they're trying, they're walking through it. And every single day I'm talking to them and asking how they're doing. Right. My nine-year-old tried to bury himself in his electronics for mm -hmm. the first two or three weeks. And he got kind of argumentative at bedtimes and really thinking that he could stay up all night on his tablet and sleep all day. And I get that he was just trying to block out the world. Of and course he was. Yeah, and, and the overwhelmed feeling of having people constantly in our house, which they just, they didn't know how to process it the same way that I can. No, they're and, not equipped for that. Why would they be? They're not supposed to yeah, be equipped for that. Exactly. I mean, and, and we, we tend to have a quiet house. When it's just me at the house, it's like the TV is hardly ever on. Um, you know, obviously when Doug was still full time at the house, TV was constantly on or the Xbox or something like that. Like it's just different tempo. It's the kids have gotten used to when it's just mom here, it's quiet. When it's mom and dad here, it's loud. And so I think that with the grief, it was just loud for a long time. 
but they're they're figuring it out and they have therapy um you know we have to do it online because like i said i'm the only provider in the county so but they have really good good people that are out of an office an hour and a half south of us and i'm really really happy with with their providers you know i i trust that they're going to support my kiddos um well that's good to know yeah i want them to always talk to me about stuff and how are you where's your mind at right now I think I'm holding back an avalanche yeah. because I've had to stay in task mode and only little, you know, releases of some of the top of the steam pressure coming off every once in a while. Um, and so I, I know that I need to let myself cry. Yeah. I know that I need to let myself grieve because I'm, I miss him. I am may have grieved a lot of the marriage part but that doesn't mean i grieved him and now i i i miss him he was my friend for 10 years and you know he my our anniversary present came after he passed away he had gotten some of my favorite books signed by an author and that came after he passed away and he had bought me chocolate the day before he died and I can't touch it. And it's my favorite dang chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> of course you can't touch it. Yeah. I mean, like it's, there are little things that I miss um, and big things that I miss. And yet while I might be in a different spot than a lot of other widows at a month out because of some of the other things that were just going on in our marriage, it's it's complicated so i i know that i need some time to actually grieve and for me to do that i need alone time but i don't want to be away from my kids either it's like this push and pull at the same time yeah that's a catch-22 for certain because you you know you need to support them but yeah you damn well know you need to grieve yeah and there is a woman um so I'm, I would imagine that you heard about the Prescott 19 mm-hmm. hot shots that passed away in 2013. Yep. So I have been kind of lightly online friends with Amanda Marsh, Eric Marsh's uh, widow, for a couple of years. And I've reached out to her for help for other things or to help friends over the years. And after she heard about Doug passing away, she and I had like an hour long conversation. It was oh, absolutely amazing. I adore her. And so she's really helping me walk on this path also and being a good guiding light. And she connected me with, she connected me with a friend of hers who is a psychologist and who also had her husband pass away from suicide. And I think that she found him too, because it's, it's all these different levels of you know, widow and then widow to suicide. And then the one that finds them, there's so many different layers mm-hmm. to all this. And from some of the groups that I'm in, the widows of suicide, the story is so similar of alcohol and secrets and shame and then sudden switch of everything. And then it's all gone. And yet these women are filled with so much hurt and anger. And, and you know, I'm not here to ever slam Doug publicly because I adored him. But I also don't want to keep his shame or his secrets because then I might pass that to my kids. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. I mean, it's a, that stuff is just so easily passed down. Yeah. And so as I can be kind of contagious for lack of better words, you know, once we see it as an option, it becomes an option. Yeah. And I don't want it to be an option for my kids. I want them to know that there are different ways to process things and that secrets are never worth it. I mean, like little kids that have a secret about, you know, flipping off their teacher and yet they're anxiety ridden about telling that and yeah. in therapy, they can say it and it's like, it comes out and then they feel better and it's amazing, you know, yeah. but that stuff builds as we get older. Our secrets are more complicated and I don't want my kids to feel any shame. And so I'm trying not to keep secrets. I'm editing things obviously. Yeah. Um, based on their ages. Yeah. No, that that's, that's common sense. Yeah. You know, and unfortunately, some of those questions are going to come up again as they go through stages of, of maturing and growing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I want to be an open source for them to process it. And, you know, that there were some people that didn't want us to even acknowledge that it was a suicide in any of the funeral process. And, and while I understand that, 
I think that that promotes stigma yeah. and that promotes the shame and the secrets. And I think that if we acknowledge it, we never actually said the word suicide in the funeral service, but we, the pastor and I both acknowledged that it, he took his life and acknowledged the pain. And a lot of his friends got up and spoke about it too. And he had tremendous amounts of pain and it's no one's fault. It wasn't his fault either. That's a good point. That's a, that's a very valid point. Um, people like to blame the victim at times and, and there are two, well, there are more two victims, but you, you understand when that simplifies it between you and, and Doug, there are two victims there. You know, yeah. He, um, you know, we, we can't get into all those demons because you don't even know all the demons he had, you know, from, from no. childhood, you just know they had them and they built over the years and they, they festered for lack of a better term. And, and, and ultimately that was his decision. And, and unfortunately it does affect so many people. It does. And I, and I wish that he had never been affected with those things. And I tried to scream louder than the voices of his demons. And I, I guess I couldn't, but I, I do believe that it wasn't him. He, as a person, was a fabulous, wonderful, warm, fucking funny. He had the laugh of like Eddie Murphy. Um, he was a very vivacious person and goofy and sexy and all those things. And he wanted to help people. But he also had this, the stuff that he battled. And like the title of your show, The Things We All Carry, he carried a lot. Yeah. He really, really did. And he never should have carried that much. And I wanted to help him, but I also, yes, as a card carrying member of the codependency club, I just <laughs> <laughs> way too much. Right. And I couldn't. And there's a lot of guilt with that, but I know that it's it's no one's fault. And I I really don't believe it was Doug's fault either. Wow. That's uh I mean, it's a hell of a story. And and to be honest with you, it's kind of just beginning because you are in the recovery mode. And so you know, I'm going to have to check in with you. Yeah. I'm going to have to know where this yeah. goes. So, um, yeah, I, am. Um, I don't ever end the show with, with the heavy stuff. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit more and I'm going to ask you the two questions I warned you about. And you've listened to yes. a couple now you've listened to or at least one episode in leading up to this. I, I have to tell the audience that, that you've never listened to a podcast before. So I'm going to call you out. I'll, I'll call you out a little bit. You're, you're 45 years old and there, I, I even said your age. So you can get mad at me because I'm not <laughs> supposed to do that, but you're 45, never heard a podcast before. And your 16 year old is making fun of you for having been on one before listening to one. But I guess you did listen to one first. I, I did finally, I did finally, but yes, I have, I have so many clients that are like, you need to listen to this podcast. You need to listen to this. And I just, I seriously, I'm like, you can recommend all day. I'm, I, I, it's not my thing. It's like watching YouTube. It's not my thing, but, <laughs> but I listen to audio books. And so it's, I didn't realize how similar it was. Yeah. It, they're very similar, very similar. So you, the first question is a sense of awe. I, um, I put out a writing prompt to the uh, channel that I do on the broadcast channel for the Instagram account. And I asked, you know, what, give me an idea of a writing prompt. I want to know something that, that we can start with. And one of the answers was, when was the last time you had a sense of awe? And I sat with that question forever because I don't think it's easy to answer. I, I, just in the question itself is something that's so out of the ordinary, it, it stops you in your tracks, right? So yeah. when was the last time you felt a sense of awe? Well, the last time, that makes it even more complicated because I can think of times before, <laughs> but the last time... I would have to say it was actually just a couple of weeks ago and realizing that my two older sisters and my niece and my niece's seven week old baby flew out from across the country from different parts to come support me. And I haven't seen them in five and eight years. Yeah. And it was just this sense of awe of like, no matter what in the hard times, I have, and my kids have, most importantly, like we have tremendous amounts of support. And the awe of one group of Doug's family that flew out from L.A., it was like 20 of them filling my living room mm -hmm. the day that they left to go back. I'm sure they filled up the entire little tiny plane. But just the awe of like all the family that came from all over, my family, his family. And it hasn't been like that since our wedding. 
and it just filled me with a lot of just gratitude. So let's do this. That's, that's good that you experienced that in this instance. Go ahead, give me one of those that you, you, you can think of pre. Pre Doug's death. Yes. Um, before we left California, uh, Doug and I took a trip to the coast because it was only an hour and a half away. Uh, like Mendocino Coast. It's absolutely beautiful. It's where we got engaged. Um, it's where we stayed for little, what we called mini moons because we never took a honeymoon together. So we would just do these little weekend trips and just watching the ocean waves. That's my favorite sense of awe is it, it always puts me in a sense of awe just watching the ocean waves crashing in and out and, you know, use that image during labor with kids of contractions being like ocean waves and now grief like ocean waves. So that's probably my favorite memory is just watching the ocean, trying to remember it, going, knowing that I'm going to this place full of grasslands and right. hardly any trees and definitely no ocean nearby in North Dakota. I love that imagery though. The, the, the grief is, is kind of like the waves because it, it, it is so very true. And it's just the waves are a physical, you know, representation of, of what that feels like to go through grief. Yeah. And sometimes it's a tsunami and sometimes it's a little puddle. Yeah. And sometimes there's laughter. This is true too. It's weird. And it's weird, but sometimes there's laughter and grief. Yeah. I think it's necessary. Oh, absolutely. We're trying to tell lots of funny stories and, yeah. you know, shenanigans and stuff. Yeah. And then it's immediately followed by tears, but whatever. We, we, you think about the laughter, right? That's okay. <laughs> All right. So what's, what's a book you want to recommend to my audience? Hey, I am going to give a shout out to Doug's cousin, actually. Oh, okay. She wrote a book that I love and I love reading kind of vampire, witch, really good character development stories as right. entertainment to like let go of the day. Cause I, you know, deal with trauma a lot during the day. And so she wrote a book called The Other Side, Wolf Moon. Okay. And it, she goes under a pseudonym as C.L. Wolf. Okay. Like in the ocean sea. And it's an absolutely fabulous book. Okay. And so she sent a signed copy for my birthday. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's the first time I've had someone other than an author state, you know, a book like that has a per personal connection like that. So that's awesome. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my dad wrote books. Um, I have a good friend that I worked with at a prison in California that's written books. I, I, I love books, but I'd rather drop a name for someone I know than, yeah. than it's a really good book too. I, um, I can't thank you enough. This conversation was, it was, you know, obviously it's not an easy conversation, but it was fascinating. And, and I appreciate mm -hmm. you coming on and, and being willing to share it, being willing to be open. And I'm going to get it out as soon as possible, along with the links again and again, and see, see what we can do for you. Um, can you, can you do me a favor and kind of touch base when you hear about the mortgage and everything? And so we know what's going on there. Absolutely. Absolutely. I will. I mean, it's, I guess I'm just kind of in limbo mode, which usually we feel anxiety when we don't have information. I don't have any information yet, but yeah. I, I will definitely let you know. And then um, you, you have my contact information. You don't hesitate to reach out if you, if you need anything or if you, if you need me to give shouts for, for other things. All right. Yes. Yes. I do have to ask you one question. Of course. Is that a Dropkick Murphy's picture behind you? That is a Dropkick Murphy's picture behind me. Okay. So that's one of the songs that Doug asked to be played at his funeral was the um, Amazing Grace by Dropkick Murphy's yeah. was the first song. So I, yeah, went, I, I went, just had to say that. I went last, not this past uh, St. Patrick's Day, but last year at St. Patrick's Day, went to Boston and saw them play in Boston on St. Patrick's Day. And uh, ah, that would be so fun. It, it was an experience. I, I was, uh, I'm a little older than you and, and I was on the edge of the, of the pit and, and it, I was, I was fighting for my life at times. <laughs> and I kept thinking, why the fuck am I in the pit? But it was well worth it. It was one hell of an experience. And, and it's, you can see the, the poster next to it is a Turnpike Troubadours poster. And, and they actually opened the show for Dropkick Murphys. So oh, it was cool. just one of those shows that just, it was two, two worlds of mind colliding together in one show. And you see the, 
the B. I'm I'm a big uh-huh. Boston fan. I um I was born in Massachusetts, so just it's kind of like these things coming together for the for the perfect storm for me. Yeah, that makes sense. I lived in Bedford for three years. Okay. Yeah, I know where that is. Yeah, yeah I was like yep. I said, I was born in Lowell, so and I uh, try to get back to Boston every once in a while. Yeah. Well, it just makes sense that, you know, you and I connected and that's perfect also with the Dropkick Murphys connection. Yeah, too. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was a good choice for, for a song. Yeah. And and on, well, thank a, you. on a side note, when you mentioned that he came to you with a little playlist, I hear a lot of us have done that. And, and it's it's it is um, sometimes when you present somebody with, hey, this is a playlist. You know, what's that playlist for us? Ah, this is the songs that I, I think that we should play at a, at a funeral for me. What, why are you planning a funeral? And it's not that you're planning. Like at that point, I'm, I'm sure Doug wasn't planning anything at that point. It was just he, like you said, he had a feeling he would be he would go before you. And some of us have that feeling. And I talked about it on my last show. It was like I never I was never actively considering a suicide, but I never had the feeling I was going to live to a certain age. And so I did create a playlist and it it went over like a lead balloon, to be honest with you. And I wish I still had it because I don't like like I said I don't plan on doing anything but I but I don't want it to be a somber event if if, right. if I go I want a celebration and I want yeah. I want the music that I enjoyed being played at my funeral so I, I connected when you said that it, it made sense to me oh we played so much music yeah. at the after event in the local bar I mean the there was a slideshow that was like 40 minutes long and it had just so much music. It was hard to narrow it down, but I, I had to drop Snoop Dogg off of it because I was like, yeah, some people might, you know, freak out a little bit for that, but it was an eclectic <laughs> mix. I love it. All right. Well, listen, thank you very much. I, I appreciate your time and I hope that we can get some answers for you and we can get some, some, some cash flow in your way. So, you know, if, if, if you get blessed with too much, then find a charity to give it to, you know? Oh, absolutely. Goodness gracious. Yeah. So, but thank you. You're welcome. And I I think all the thanks goes to you. Go and kind of try and enjoy the rest of your day. I'm sure you've got clients to see and and snow to get ready for. Yes, there's always that. Okay. But thank you. Take care of yourself out there. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Things We All Carry. Head over to the website, thethingsweallcarry.com, for show notes, resources, and to sign up for the newsletter. Until next week, take care of yourselves and remember to check in on each other.